Hi, and welcome to the Resilia Overview Program. In this program, we're going to discuss the integration of the Resilia Framework for Cyber Resilience, the IDLE Framework for Service Management, and the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, and some of the implications for management and executive teams. So one of the realities that we see as organizations and technology become more complex is that we're no longer in the situation where it's possible that we're going to experience a breach. It's a, more of a question of when. It's going to happen. And so part of our conversation has to shift from how do I prevent a breach to how do I effectively detect if breaches make it through our perimeter and how do we respond in a corrective way in a way that help us successfully respond. Prevention as a, an exclusive approach to dealing with cyber resilience is no longer viable. Given the number of suppliers and partners, channel customers, and change, it's simply no longer an alternative to count on prevention alone. So in order for your organization to successfully continue to compete and meet its mission and vision, your organization itself has to become cyber resilient. That means working together to build certain types of practices and capabilities to be able to sustain yourselves in this new and dynamic space. So if you think about how computing began many years ago, we had room-sized computers and effectively there was no connectivity. People would come in, do the things they would do, and leave. As computers became smaller and more powerful, and especially with the introduction of the public internet, then the conversation shifted from what the computer could do to what the network could do and how the network created opportunities but also how the network created challenges and risks. As we've continued to see a diversification of items from personal computers now to mobile devices and eventually to this thing we'll call the Internet of Things, everything is moving to a point where it's communicating with and connected to everything else. And so each one of those creates opportunities for us, but each one of those also creates new risks and new vulnerabilities and potential challenges associated to the cyber resilience of our organization. So this has had a tremendous change on organizations and business models, especially over the last 20 years or so as traditional brick-and-mortar stores became click-and-mortar stores. And you can see how this has played out in organizations like Amazon, Netflix, the App Store, and so forth. And traditional supply chains have become transformed as well into very dynamic value networks where you constantly have different suppliers, different customers collaborating with you to produce different, very customized sets of solutions to different types of business problems. Because of that, we see a dramatic increase in the complexity of the business relationships we have to manage through outsourcing and other strategic sourcing strategies, through joint ventures and partnerships, and eventually downstream through different types of customer and delivery channels. And so modern structures drive agility over size. And your organization's ability to adapt and adopt new practices fundamentally drives the strategic value of your ability to compete and win, to be able to meet your market objectives, and to be able to meet the needs of your organization and its board. And so part of the challenge then becomes how do we consider and deal with all of the risks and vulnerabilities associated with being in such a dynamic space. So what we're seeing, of course, is again a full proliferation of this down to things that we don't even think about as computers anymore. Your refrigerator, your dryer, various aspects of your car or your television set. All of these are now fundamentally connected in ways that allow us at one level to have tremendous value, to be able to communicate effectively with, for example, my dryer to know when my clothes are dry and I can go and pick them up. Or that I'm low on milk and I need to stop at the store on the way home. On the other hand, every single one of those connectivities creates risk, too. That anything that creates access to my networks creates a vulnerability and a set of challenges and a set of potential risks that we will be attacked and that our services will be compromised. So 
previous and more traditional approaches to how we protect things focused on the technology. They focused very specifically on prevention activities. How do I utilize tools like intrusion detection systems and firewalls, practices like access control in order to be able to prevent certain types of bad things from happening? And that's certainly a good goal. And we certainly are not suggesting that we can't do prevention activities. We certainly want to. But at the same point in time, it's become clear that it's not enough that even the very best prevention strategy is going to leave us short because effectively we would have to get it right every single time and someone who's attacking us only needs to get through once to be able to compromise what we do. So in order for our organization to become cyber resilient we're going to have to move beyond thinking purely about prevention to be able to think instead about how can we detect if somebody actually passes through our preventative controls and then how quickly can we then respond and put in place appropriate corrective actions and most especially from our perspective as executives and managers appropriate communications and collaboration so that we can minimize impact to our businesses and to our customers. So when we talk about cyber resilience again we can think about this as a capability but even more broadly, we need to think about it in terms of how our organizations must be to survive and thrive in the future. We want to be able to continue our operations and continue to meet our organization's mission and objectives even if some particular attack were to make it through our preventative controls. And so if you think about this from a governance perspective, if I'm a member of a board of directors, my interest is very simple. How do I optimize our risks? How do I optimize the use of our resources? How do we deliver the intended benefits from the organization? And so enabling cyber resilience across your entire enterprise is deep and fundamental to being able to support these board level objectives. Adopting and thinking about cyber resilience in this holistic manner means that, that we need to have a much clearer understanding of what our critical assets are including the various information that is critical to our business and our business practices. A clear environment of our threats and vulnerabilities both inside our organizations and things that can be introduced through environmental hazards, through our customers, through our partners or supply chains. And then given that, how do we establish both a coherent language and collaborating with our stakeholders and a way to assess, for better or for worse, our current level of maturity in cyber resilience practices so that we can figure out how to drive iterative improvements against that. So eventually, of course, what we're trying to get to is the appropriate balance between the preventative controls that we're comfortable with and better detective and corrective controls that allow us to establish and take advantage, for example, of good automation to be able to mitigate impact if somebody breaches our protective controls. And this is not just about IT. This is about working with our people, working with our business processes, and effectively establishing a culture where cyber resilience is both expected and a fundamental part of your strategy. And in order for us to be successful with this, we have to integrate this at the highest levels of the organization as a fundamental part of your risk management practices, and then effectively use management systems to successfully execute how we provision and deliver these controls. So eventually, of course, your organization exists to be able to take advantage of certain opportunities, to be able to drive toward your mission, and to be able to achieve your vision. Well, in order for us to be able to get there, we want to be able to deliver on those goals and objectives, and at the same time, we have to figure out how to manage the risks that we face along the way. So clearly, there's a balancing act to be had here. I want to spend the right amount of money on risk awareness and risk mitigation, and I want to be able to identify how I balance that in a way that optimizes our organization's ability to perform. So in order for you as executive managers to make appropriate and informed choices, it's critical that we as an organization supporting you work together to understand your critical assets, to understand the relative vulnerabilities and threats you face, to be able to figure out then what risks you realistically have and the likelihood those risks would be realized. And then to be able to use appropriate risk management techniques to come up with risk treatment plans that work. 
So by establishing what I'm going to call the right level of security and resilience controls, we're going to add some cost and inconvenience, but we want to be able to balance that with a level of assurance and confidence that we're going to be able to deliver the service value we've intended to our customers and other channel partners and stakeholders, and that we're going to be able to collaborate successfully with the suppliers and partners that we count on to deliver success. So eventually, in order to be able to support cyber resilience, we want to be able to adapt and adopt a management system. So management systems allow us to think about how we're going to take strategic goals and execute. And almost all organizations have various types of management systems, some very formalized, some much more informal. Eventually, what we want to be able to do is to take your strategic goals and objectives and drive them through how the execution eventually takes place in support of the organization's needs. And so Oxalos' cyber resilience infrastructure in the Resilia framework uses the ITSM lifecycle. Okay, this includes broad strategic planning, design of appropriate controls, transition and risk management as controls are introduced, operational support and ultimately operational responsiveness where necessary, and then continual improvement throughout all of the activities that we talk about. So very quickly, to try to understand how the IT service management lifecycle supports this broader idea of cyber resilience, I want to be able to look to use strategy to manage my constraints. Effectively, of course, your organization has strategic goals and objectives, and we want to ensure that service investments and commitments reflect your needs and priorities. So all the resources that get consumed in designing, developing, implementing, and supporting the various services you use should be cost justified based on the business value that creates for your organization and your stakeholders. Likewise, I then want to be able to ensure that when we design services, that we're designing against the appropriate strategy. That when we're transitioning services, that we're transitioning whether we're dealing with new services or changes to existing services, in a way that optimizes the risk-reward balance for the business. And then from an operations perspective, how do we sustainably host and deliver services so that your organizations can successfully execute against your mission? Last and certainly not least, all of your organizations, for better or for worse, are where they are now. And so one of the things you want to drive as part of your overarching culture is a culture of very intentional continual service improvement where we're looking at existing performance and using metrics and measures to drive explicit improvements in our processes, in our services, and ultimately in the level of ability for us to serve our customers and stakeholders. So you can see in the cyber resilience framework in Resilia, what Axelos has done is effectively take the whole idea of the service lifecycle and apply it as a management system for the purpose of driving and supporting cyber resilience. We want to establish a properly aligned cyber resilience strategy for the enterprise, not just for IT, but for everybody. And then given that, how do we design appropriate controls? How do we support the risk management and introduction of those controls in a way that helps us get the benefits associated with them while managing risk? And then how do we operate and drive improvement against those controls so we can take advantage of our experience, our knowledge, and frankly deal with the changes in the real world that are happening based on new technologies and vulnerabilities, based on changes in legal and regulatory expectations, changes in customer expectations, or just plain new business opportunities and new strategies. So part of what we want to be able to think about as executives and managers is that complex systems are certainly everywhere and certainly within our own organizations. And when we talk about cyber resilience, this is fundamentally a survival strategy for you and your organization. Organizations that are compromised by cyber resilience issues often don't survive, regardless of their size. And there's plenty of examples in the media of very large organizations that have seen extremely large-scale damage to their reputations, to their stock prices, to their ability to continue as organizations delivering value because of cyber resilience challenges. And so, in order for your organization to be able to meet these challenges going forward, your organization is going to have to build its capacity to adapt, to be able to effectively deal with uncertainties in how you manage your strategies, 
to be able to facilitate and handle change while managing risk, and to be able to use good quality information to improve your decision making. And so by using these approaches, what we're effectively encouraging you to do is to establish continual improvement as a core capability within your organization for the purpose of looking at existing business outcomes and driving iterative improvements against those. So when we think about continual improvement in this context then, this isn't just a question of running various types of operational or iterative improvements to smaller things, but fundamentally about your organization strategy. How do you as an organization make it a fundamental part of your culture to adopt and adapt practices as you need to? And eventually what we want to be able to do, especially in the context of building a cyber resilient organization, is to figure out how to stabilize existing practices, how to be able to effectively enhance those, and then optimize them over the long run. And so in order to get there, we need to understand the connections between and among our organization and our suppliers and partners, how various business processes deliver value and what cyber resilience activities are needed to be able to sustain and maintain those, and how we support the outcomes that customers need. And so in many ways, we have to think about this at two levels. From a large organizational level, we want to be able to ensure that we're continuing to optimize how strategic value accrues. How do we build and improve quality of service in a way that drives the right level of performance and the right level of benefit to your business and stakeholder. Likewise, in a micro level, we want to be able to drive small iterative improvements across all of our processes, all of our services, and all of our cyber resilience controls to be able to ensure that we are iteratively getting better and that we're continuing to adapt and adopt as our risks changes, our various types of vulnerabilities change. So one of the things that's happening in the broader organization and in, in effectively large numbers of global organizations is that improvement has become a core competency. So if you think about this in the context of Jeffrey Moore's studies in the past, what we're really looking at is that continual improvement itself is very much a strategic investment. Your ability to be agile, to take advantage of business opportunities, to be flexible in the services that you deliver to customers, and to be able to adapt to changes in your environment is deep and fundamental to your ability to compete and win, to meet your mission, to support your vision, and to meet your overall organizational goals and objectives. So this becomes a fundamental part of how your governance teams evaluate, direct, and monitor organizational strategy and practices, and how your management team plans, builds, runs, and improves services that you deliver. So if you look at the traditional quadrants, what we're talking about in continual improvement, especially in the context of cyber resilience, becomes very deeply core to who you are, regardless of your sourcing strategy, and is truly the kind of critical activity that you want to spend your energy focusing on. So eventually what you want to be able to do is to combine strategic thinking in terms of how we effectively evaluate options, internalize and build new normal capabilities, describe to others how we want people to operate within the organization, and discover new opportunities for improvement with traditional continual improvement activities that happen inside each of your organizations. How we plan improvements, how we do them on small scale, how we check or study to see what that's telling us, and how we act on what we find. And so effectively what this allows us to do is to create a new agile view of continual service improvement where there's a clear link between strategic planning based on descriptions of goals and objectives, and our ability to study gaps with existing performance and aim our resources in a way that improves our strategic consistency and improves at the same time our operational flexibility. It allows us, in the classic sense, to start achieving the infamous do more with less. Right? Well, how do we really get there? If we have the right alignment between strategic planning and, and objective setting, and our ability to execute on continual improvement activities, we're much more likely to get toward the outcomes that we're looking for. So again, there are different types of frameworks, models, and quality systems you can bring to bear together to think about how you build a cyber-resilient organization. 
So one of the pieces we're going to encourage you to think about is the NIST cybersecurity framework. This was created and published by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the United States Department of Commerce, published in 2014, and it effectively describes a risk-based approach for how we're going to manage risk related to cybersecurity, as they call it. So there are three main parts to this. The first, the framework core, describes key outcomes that we want. And these are expressed as certain functions that we might have. Yeah, so I might describe a particular function as you know, access controls, for example. Right. We might then describe a set of implementation tiers. How disciplined is our set of approaches related to that particular framework capability or those particular categories? So is this fairly ad hoc and inconsistent? Is this very agile and adaptive and very, very, very well you know, structured and very mature? Somewhere in between. Right? And what is the need that your organization brings to that? And then how do we connect those in a way that help us establish a coherent set of profiles and effectively give us clarity on how and where we need to aim in order to drive improvements? Now, the NIST framework was intended for organizations that manage critical infrastructure and critical assets. But if you think about it, isn't that almost all of us now? In terms of the kind of customer information we have access to, in terms of the kinds of privacy laws and regulations that we're held accountable to. So if you think about how the framework is structured, it begins with a set of categories and subcategories to help us think about certain subsets of the work. How we, for example, manage remote access. From there, I want to be able to think about how disciplined and how clearly and efficiently our organization manages those activities. And again, the NIST framework identifies four levels here from very ad hoc and consistent levels to very adaptive formalized levels. At the third place, what I want to be able to do is to connect you know, how these particular tiers and cores come together to produce a profile. And what the profile allows me to look at is for a particular function, and let's say a function might be protection, right? I want to be able to protect certain portions of my infrastructure. And then different categories. In this case, maybe access control is a category and maybe remote access is a subcategory. Right? How would I, in fact, establish the appropriate practices in order to be able to have some level of assurance that this is going to work? And in this instance, it might refer me, for example, to the ISO 27001 standard. Okay, and the ISO 27001 standard might provide me very specific auditable steps in order to ensure that I'm following certain good practices for managing remote access. Next of the key things to understand related to the NIST framework is effectively it helps us establish a continual improvement approach to all of this. So the framework core describes things we should be doing. And many of these things we kind of sort of are doing to a certain extent. And then the framework tiers help us to assess and understand, given what we should be doing, how rigorously do we do it as an organization? From there, I can really begin to assess you know, how the various profiles allow me to establish the difference between where we are at current state, what our current level of capability is regarding that particular capability, and where we would like to be in terms of our future state. So what do we need to do then in order to be able to identify that gap and then to be able to identify specific steps that we can use to go and close that gap? So using the NIST framework alongside the Resilia framework is very, very helpful in being able to not only describe theoretically what a cyber resilient organization might look like or what steps we might follow, but specifically how we might get there. So eventually now we have an opportunity to tie together these three frameworks in a way that helps you really revision how to do cyber resilience within your organization. Beginning with the basic ideas in the idle, we want to be able to drive improvements to our practices. We want to be able to drive improvements to our organization, our profitability, our ability to serve our customers. And we certainly want to be able to drive improvements to the various services we provision and deliver. So the IT service management lifecycle helps us assess and understand strategic planning of resources, design transition of those resources into real services we can provision and deliver, and then operating those in ways that support the business organization's 
and the ways that support your customers and other stakeholders. When we start thinking about using techniques like Agile CSI as an approach to how we drive iterative improvements to this, we can see that cyber resilience can then become a fundamental capability based on your current level of capabilities today, but using a specific iterative approach to stabilize existing practice, identify and drive enhancements, and then continue to build and optimize that over the long run in a way that helps you continually respond to new threats, new vulnerabilities, and new challenges. Lastly, frameworks like the NIST cybersecurity framework help us do a clear job of identifying current state issues, identifying potential gaps for strategic planning and improvement activity, and then ultimately helping us to define a desired state and helping to think through how exactly it is that we can execute on specific improvements that are going to help us take us from our existing capabilities to the desired future. So this raises some fundamental challenges for each of you. We all are in situations where we are in, under increasing scrutiny from legal and regulatory authorities, where we have an increasing level of focus on these issues from insurers who are trying to understand how this changes risk and may change the cost of insuring your organizations in the future. We are certainly seeing increasing diversities of risks and threats and increasing levels of complexity both in our technologies and perhaps even more so in our business arrangements and business workflows. And so these create opportunities for new service models, but they also create enormous challenges in how we maintain a cyber resilient organization that can be successful and thrive and survive in a very, very dynamic future. So this creates some very specific to do items I encourage you to think through. I encourage you to take the information from this program and use it to raise awareness with your board of directors, other executive management teams so that they understand where this sits alongside other organizational priorities. You may want to take time to specifically look at your desired future state. Where does your organization really need to be in terms of cyber resilience in order to meet your organization's objectives and to balance the cost value question? You want to be able to effectively communicate that vision to and through your management teams and begin to drive specific action toward building continual improvement as a capability and really to start driving continual improvement as a, for, a core part of your culture. And then last and certainly not least, this is going to require your ongoing commitment to educate your teams on this need. Why is this important to the organization? Why is this important to your organization's stakeholders? Why is this important in terms of the value you deliver, not only within your own organization, but to your entire channel? And then given that, what are the specific things you as an organization should probably do to start raising that awareness among your other stakeholders inside your organization and in your partner channels as well. We appreciate you taking the time to be part of this overview. Thank you very much for your attention and please feel free to reach out with follow-up questions. Thank you.